coming back. <laughs> Amos, seventh chapter. Thank you, Lord, for Brother Darrell bringing the word last week. And uh, I heard some crazy stuff while I was out. So hearing Brother Darrell preach the truth, bless my soul. <laughs> For real. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. In the seventh chapter, we are at the tenth verse. Going through 17. Chapter 7, verses 10 through 17. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. And the land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from his land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go, flee away from the land of Ju to, the la to the land of Judah. And he bred there, prophesied there, but never again prophesied Bethel. It is a king's sanctuary, and it is a temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I was a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore figs. But the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. Now, therefore, Hear the word of the Lord. You say, Don't, do not prophesy against Israel and do not preach against the house of Isaac. Therefore, thus says the Lord, your wife shall be a prostitute in the city and your sons and your daughters shall fall by the sword and your land shall be divided up with a measuring line. And you yourself shall die in an unclean land. And Israel, by the way, shall surely go into exile away from its land. The word of the Lord. As I was preparing this, I'm thinking of Jim Jones and the People's Temple in Jonestown, Guyana. Or David Koresh and the Branch Davidians in Waco, Texas. Those of you who know about those two uh, cults know that hundreds, and hundreds of people died as a result of people following those leaders. Less obviously harmful is Charles Tad Russell of the Jehovah Witnesses very much among us to this day, unfortunately, not teaching what thus saith the Lord. These are leaders that most or many of us understand have led people to stray. And as I said earlier, some to their deaths. But what about the ones that aren't so obvious, like today's priest? They are so tied up with the establishment, you might not be able to tell if they are off. And yet, today we enter a scene where the priest in charge faces a man who does know he is off and is able to tell him, literally tell him off in the name and for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I mean of the Lord God, Yahweh at the time. Should say. That priest is Amaziah. Who is Amaziah? He is the high or chief priest at the main sanctuary of the nation located in Bethel, which we have talked about. So we all know that Bethel was the proverbial mother, mother sanctuary. He is the head honcho over the religious system in Israel under the esteemed authority of King Jeroboam II. 
Unfortunately, this means that he is the man who presides over this superficial and false religion that does not honor Yahweh and is the maestro, if you please, of the worship practices that Yahweh hates and rejects. Specifically, the feasts, the solemn assemblies, the burnt grain and peace offerings, and the songs of praise that were noise to Yahweh, to which he refused to listen. We don't never want that to happen here, amen? amen. He had considerable power to orchestrate, regulate, and protect Jeroboam II's sanctuary and civil religion. Its machinery hummed along every day, side by side with sin and injustices that plagued the land. In the eyes of Yahweh, it was wicked. And we can see from the text that Amaziah benefited from his post. He had a family and he had property. Now the exact date of this encounter with, with Amos is unknown, except that it did take place when Amos's voice could no longer be ignored. It was shaking things up. And Amaziah felt it was time to confront this dude, shut him up, and get him out of town. Now Amaziah's first action was to report to the king, verses 10 through 11. Amos was engaged in some kind of conspiracy with the intent to overthrow the king and this prosperous establishment of law of order right under their nose. His words were a direct threat to the king and his sanctuary. And further, the land, meaning the people, the nation, could not stand to hear his words any longer. His message was starting to disrupt the peace and unity of the nation, <laughs> demoralizing and unsettling the people. They could create problems for the king's maintenance of law, order, and the sense of security so that they, specifically the elite, continue living and prospering as they had been without any fear that there would be any future interruption in their way of life. His summary of Amos' words was, Jeroboam shall die by the sword and Israel must go into exile away from his land. <clears throat> well, actually, that was a misrepresentation of Amos' words. What Amos said was that God, quote, would rise against the house, the house of Jeroboam II, that is his dynasty, with the sword. Not that Jeroboam himself would die by the sword. Amos did say, however, that Israel would go into exile time and time and time again, such as in chapter 4, verses 2 and 3, chapter 5, verses 5 and 27. Jeroboam II died actually peacefully, according to 2 Kings 14, 29. It says, Jeroboam slept with his fathers, the kings of Israel, and Zechariah, his son, reigned in his place. Now, it was his son, Zechariah, that died of an assassination, a successful assassination attempt, and that terminated Jeroboam II dynasty in 2 Kings 15.10. The biggest problem was Amaziah associated or disassociated Amos' message from God and connected it as the words of Amos alone. And in doing so, he effectively eliminated any call for repentance for all the socioeconomic, political, and covenantal transgressions committed by the people and dismissed any, and its leaders, of course, and transgressions 
and dismissed any warning of inescapable judgment from God if they did not repent. It's like, oh, that's just Amos talking. We don't have to pay attention. He's just, you know, running his mouth. Then Amaziah attempts to evict Amos from the land. Maybe a better word is expel Amos from the land. He called him a seer, which was correct, given his visions and the statement in chapter 1, verse, verse 1, the words of Amos, which he saw. And the word saw there has the same root as the word seer later in the, in the passage we're looking at today. Now, I agree with those that say that he, Amaziah, was recognizing Amos' giftedness, yes. He wasn't trying to put him down. Because some, think, some, some think that because he called him a seer, he was demoting the fact that he was, in fact, a prophet. I actually think he was recognizing, okay, he may be a legit prophet, but stop prophesying in Bethel, please. In fact, do not prophesy anywhere else in Israel. Get out, go back home to Tekoa and Judah and prophesy. Now by making these demands, he was accomplishing two things, silencing Amos' words and geographically removing this contrarian voice. He implies that Amos is prophesying for hire as an emissary for a particular school of prophets anyway, and tells them, look, dude, you can make plenty of money prophesying in Judah in your home. Just go down there. Prophesy all you want. You'll be well paid. Everything will be fine. And we'll be rid of your harassment. Notice that he tells Amos he can't prophesy there because it's the king's sanctuary and the temple of the kingdom. He doesn't state that he speaks for God. He states that he speaks for the king. Hold on. I thought the priests were supposed to speak for God. Last I checked, the priests were there to minister to the people in behalf of God. Right. This guy was so sidetracked, he didn't even understand what he was supposed to be, who he was supposed to serve. He talks about the king. He's supposed to be God. Right. He's a grace for crying out loud. Well, Amos responds, verses 14 and 15, Amos first establishes that he is not a professional prophet, nor is he the son of a particular school of the prophets. Yeah, and he's not denigrating the school of the prophets. He's just merely saying, I'm not a part of the school of the prophets. He was out working in the world, what we would call secular employment today. Had his own income and was minding his own business. And then God comes along, snatches him out of his vocations full time and tells him to go prophesy to his people in Israel. I, I, I can't help reading that and thinking. He was not trying to figure out what his destiny was. All he was doing was obeying God. <laughs> Running his business the way he should run it and bam, <laughs> he ends up not only a prophet, but one of the 12 prophet, writing prophets in the scriptures. How does that happen without us being involved in the mix? I mean, you know, <laughs> but that's what Amos did. Now, with Jeremiah, was different. He called Jeremiah from the womb. Jeremiah knew he was called from the womb. He didn't exactly want to go, but it was like fire shut up in his bones, he had to go. But Amos, 
He was just doing what he's supposed to do. And God said, hey, I'm calling you. I'm calling you to this. And Amos says yes and goes forward. Now, there are a couple of directions that com com commentators take on uh, how this was structured. Option one, he was no longer involved with livestock and fig tree, fig tree tending. He's either trusting God for his needs or is living from the income he has accumulated from his last season of business. As I stated in my first sermon when I did it, the history of Amos, that he was likely an owner of the livestock businesses and the fig trees as opposed to a hired hand. So he'd have been more of the manager or owner kind of a guy. Now, the reason for that particular option, as you can see from the passage, his translation is they translate it as in the past tense. Option two, however, which has two sides, he is bivocational. This is, he's either A, still in the business as he had, but is managing them while fulfilling the Lord's calling at this time. You know, um, he would be at home with his laptop, so to speak, in, 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 in Israel. Or B, is on leave from managing his businesses so that he could fulfill the Lord's calling. Now, these two options grow out of the translation of verse 14 in the present tense rather than the past tense. You might ask, well, why is all the, you know, discussion? Well, it's because there are four verbless clauses in verse 14 in the Hebrew. Ergo, there's no tense. So the tense has to be determined either by verse 15, which is in the past tense, or by the context. And a bit of a detail for those of you that are more theologically inclined. But I also say that in case you're reading something and you read into that and say, Pastor Sam didn't say anything about that. Well, you heard it from me. The expression took me from following the flock Intentional or not, is actually an illusion in the shadow of David, who was taken from the flock to be king over Israel. These little patterns that God does that we see reflected in Scripture. Now, although Amaziah tells him to go back to Tekoa, only God has the authority to sin where he pleases. And Amos heeds the voice of God, not the chief priest. Because God's call is irresistible and unmistakable. Amen. We tell candidates for ministry, some of you young guys out there who may one day uh, feel the call, one, one of the things we tell you is, uh, if there's anything else you can do. Right. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead and do that. But if you try to do that and you just can't resist the call of God, God let you. there you go. <laughs> then go ahead. Get in it. You'll know you're called. And down the road you'll realize and maybe even be thankful that you made the decision after you realize there's just nothing else I can do but serve the Lord. Amen. And I know those of us in here, we know what it was like when that day came, when we knew that we knew we got to go this way or else. Now, he is commanded to do the work of the prophet even though he is not in the profession of a prophet. So God chose a non-professional prophet from another country to condemn the northern kingdom. You get this? He chooses a prophet who's a non-professional, who is not from that area, sends him to that area to condemn what they're doing. Centuries later, this same God would knock 
off a horse, a Jewish Pharisee, and send that Pharisee to the Gentiles to preach the gospel. I'm just saying (laughs) what God does. Then Amos gives the word of the Lord to Amaziah, verses 16 and 17. Amos summarizes the command of Amaziah has given to him. The catch is Amos's summary is not just Amos's summary. It is God's summary. He says, you say, do not prophesy against Israel and do not preach against the house of Isaac. This statement not only summarizes what Amaziah said, but it actually summarizes Amaziah's attitude in general toward Amos. Like, this is how he felt. But then God proceeds to go further and call down judgment on Amaziah himself for being what? A false shepherd of the people. Leading them to unrepentance instead of leading them to repentance. On top of that, he was attempting to silence the voice of the Lord to God's own people. It's like telling somebody who's in somebody else's company to not do their job (laughs) when the company owner has already told them you should do that job. It's, It's that ridiculous what he's done here. So you know, Amaziah was asking for it in reality. And Amos, with the voice of Nathan the prophet of old, looked him straight in the eye and laid the cards on the table. Side note, this is the nature of the prophetic word, whether then or now. They are hard words that pull no punches. And we must be able to hear them if we are going to stay on track with God. Whatever you do pastorally must have the prophetic base in place when sin has been normalized. Prophetic words are meant to break up the fallow ground so that the heart can hear what is really going on. Amaziah and the people's hearts were so steeped in Jeroboam's II civil religion, they actually thought, that Amos was a madman in the woods trying to scare people. That was not the case. And Amaziah, as a priest, couldn't even hear himself call the temple the temple of the king instead of the temple of the Lord. And going all the way back to most, it's just astounding. And the elite, the elite could not even perceive the injustices that they were involved in as injustice. Their hearts were so stuffed with the king's ideology and blinded to reality. This is why the prophetic word is the way it is. It's got to cut through all the crap, for lack of a better word, <laughs> and, and awaken people to what's going on. Now, the judgment here is specific and cuts to the core of his life, his own wife and children. Before, Amos was declaring the word of judgment to Israel in general. Now, he's declaring the word of judgment to the chief priest in particular. You got to admire Amos' courage. You know. You know, it's got to be the power of God because I know me, I got my, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's the power of God. Hallelujah. Amen. One commentator describes this whole scene like this. The judgment reflects the tragic aftermath of military defeat and warfare. 
the tragic fate of women, the death of children, and the loss of property. October 7th this year kind of gives some reality to that for us. His wife would be publicly humiliated in the very city where the premier sanctuary was located, Bethel, driven to prostitution to survive, most likely. Her actions would disqualify him from the priesthood. His children, small or grown, would be slain, whether in the tumult of battle or execution after deportation. His land would be confiscated and distributed among the victors. He will himself die in another land or country far from the land of Israel and be buried in an unclean foreign place, permanently defiled. And to top it off, Amos once again highlights Israel will go into exile. Why so harsh? Because he was a false shepherd who led them astray and hardened the hearts against Yahweh. His actions actually helped seal the fate of the nation. Like Jim Jones and David Koresh in our time, his leadership led to spiritual and physical death. Well, Peter has something to say about the false teachers of our own time, his time, which would be our time in these last days. 2 Peter 2, 1 through 3. I like the NLT, how it puts it. But there, will also, but there were also false prophets in Israel, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will cleverly teach destructive heresies and even deny the master who bought them. In this way, they will bring sudden destruction on themselves. Many will follow their evil teaching and shameful immorality. And because of these teachers, the way of truth will be slandered. In their greed, they will make up clever lies to get hold of your money. But God condemned them long ago, and their destruction will not be delayed. The word of God hasn't changed when it comes to false teachers. That's right, that's right. Whatever he declared on Amaziah, Peter carries it on yep. right on up to our own day. That's right. Frightening thought. This brings me toward the end of our time together. We're bringing the plane in. <clears throat> this passage and others could map pretty easily on what I call the America of the beautiful or America of the terrible <laughs> paradigm. Amos could be Christopher Rufo or Alicia Garza depending on which side of the political spectrum you're on. But if this is more about the people of God, which it is, then I think it looks more like this. Amaziah is the institutional shepherd that presides over a faith that legitimizes and or accommodates a civil or apostate religion that is tied to the interest of an earthly state or culture rather than one that leads God's people to the worship and discipleship of God and provides salt and light for the world around it. Amos is the prophetic voice that calls into, out into the open for all to see the sins and injustices that were in plain sight in God's eyes, but ignored or unseen by the blinded shepherds authorized to see these things and discipline accordingly. Jesus called the scribes and Pharisees of his day blind guides that lead the blind into the ditch of error or strain at gnats, minor issues, and swallow camels, major errors. 
They miscalled out injustices such as, impartia such as partiality, bribery, socioeconomic practices that impoverished and oppressed the poor and powerless, and the apostate religion that ignored all this and was degenerate and despised by God. paradigm of our own age, of course, was the uh, church, the segregated church of the South, which engaged in sins of oppression and who knows what else. <laughs> the history goes on and on, but nevertheless felt justified on Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. There are other expressions of that, however, but that one that certainly we're familiar with. Amaziah attempted to engage in the ancient version of cancel culture to shut Amos up and expel him out of the country. In reality, Amaziah, Amaziah was rejecting the word of the Lord and shutting off the voice of God to the people, as I said earlier, further sealing the fate of the nation to judgment. The word of God contained in the law then and in the Bible today. <clears throat> to quote the shorter catechism, principally teaches what humankind is to believe concerning God and his creation and what duty God requires of humankind. Leaders are responsible to God for their leadership and will stand judgment accordingly James states in 3.1, not many of you should become teachers. That is, elders and pastors specifically. My brothers, for you know that we are, we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. This applies to sisters too, who also teach the body in various capacities. Leaders and shepherds must be attuned to the voice of the chief shepherd of the flock, and y'all know who that is, the Lord Jesus Christ, if we are to lead properly. Jesus stated clearly, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He explains in the Gospel of John, truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep. Hallelujah. Amen. By name and leads them out. And when he has brought them out, all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. See, Jesus laid down his life so that he could become the owner of his sheep. We belong to the Lord. We belong to the Lord. He's not like a doctor who just works on you. He's not like a psychologist or a psychiatrist that checks out your head. He's not a podiatrist that makes sure your feet are straight. He, he invites you to be a part of him. We are in the family of God. Yeah. We are brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. And we hear his voice. Not the voice of our doctor or podiatrist or psychologist. The doctor, the, 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 the brother, the, the, the one who owns us, the shepherd of us, his sheep. We who are under shepherds simply lead others to follow him. 
That's the name of the game here, to follow him. So when you hear us, you should be hearing the voice of the shepherd. If you are not, don't listen and don't follow, <laughs> okay? Yeah. Yeah. But if you hear Jesus in that, that which we share with you, then yes, follow the Lord. Because he's the one that owns you, not us. He does. He does. Well, you say, but how do you enter into that ownership? How do you become a part of him? And the answer is very simply. We come to him and seek by faith forgiveness for our sins. And he extends forgiveness washes away our sins and then gives us his righteousness so that we stand before Father God righteous and pure and, and, and acceptable to God. We become a part of the family of God at that point. He regenerates us. And there's all sorts of discussion about, you know, processes here. The bottom line is you come to him by faith and he receives you. Unto himself. And you become a sheep who is owned by the Lord Jesus Christ. You belong. Amen? Amen. That's how it happens. Pray for us who are under shepherds, elders, pastors, and the like, as well as our lady leaders as well. Please. We might lead as he would have us lead and speak up not shut up. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, as we look at what's going on here between Amaziah and Amos, we pray, first of all, for us who are under shepherds, elders, pastors, and the like, our lady lady teachers and leaders that we would do our part, our role in, on your behalf to your people. Lord, remind us that we can't do it on our own strength. We have to do it by your strength. But we are your representation here. May all of us, leaders and non-leaders alike, recognize that we are then ambassadors for Christ to our world, yes. whether it's salt or light, whatever opportunities you give us, that we would be that to our world. I ask you, Lord, secondly, that all of us as sheep would follow you and not all the craziness. Mm -hmm. That you would keep us from leaders who have sweet things to say. Lord, deliver us from itching ears. Mm -hmm. That we would not gather unto ourselves teachers that scratch where we itch. Mm -hmm. Because where we itch could send us to hell. Mm -hmm. But rather, may we receive those you send to us, we might hear the voice, your voice, Lord, and follow you. And help us as leaders to be instruments in your hands to point people to you, that they may follow you and have life in your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.